What's up everybody, Alex here with another cup of coffee video. And this is one that I've been actually wanting to make for some time. You know, one thing that I keep coming back to time and again in my card collecting is the appreciation that I have for just how these cards were made in the first place. And I mean any card, whether it's pre-war or 50s, whether it's extremely well-known or somewhat obscure. I just think part of what's cool about card collecting is not just the cards themselves, but the stories behind the companies that created and distributed them. The artwork, the styles and designs, and the innovation that went into the making of these things. This is actually one of my favorite topics when it comes to cards. And today I want to touch upon just one small part of it, which involves what are called proof cards. So first off, what is a proof? My understanding is that proof cards are cards that are essentially considered prototypes or trial runs that are printed only for internal review. So that things like layout, design, color, image quality, and so on can be evaluated by the company before production begins. Since proofs are not final products, they are often unfinished in some way. Usually these are kept for reference only or they're thrown away. In either case, they're never meant to be in collector's hands. So it should be no surprise that I've always been interested in tracking down and learning more about the proof cards from the 1953 Bowman Color set. Well, with a little bit of digging, I discovered that some of them turned up in the November 2001 Sports Card Plus auction. They were slabbed, and PSA graded them as authentic. As it turns out, political and sports commentator Keith Olbermann, who is a big card and baseball memorabilia collector, also has a set of these proofs, which he acquired long before the 2001 auction. And the scans I'm about to show you were first posted on the blog known as the Topps Archives. Let's first take a look at the Eno Slaughter card. At first glance, it looks pretty much like it's the same image. But if you look carefully, you'll notice that it's cropped slightly differently from the final version. Take a look at the edges of the photos, and you'll be able to spot the difference. Next up is Warren Spawn, and quite obviously this is a completely different pose from the final image chosen in the set. The photograph is most likely from the same photo shoot that produced the classic final card image that features the Indian headdress of the Braves logo. Now my personal vote is that Bowman made the right choice going with the final card design, but as a lover of the photography of this set, it's always a real big treat for me to get to see alternative photos from these amazing photo shoots that were done for this set. The third Bowman proof features Ferris Fain of the Philadelphia A's. Now the history behind this card is quite simply that Fain was traded to the White Sox in January of 1953. And because of that, there were no available photographs of Fain in a White Sox uniform. So he had to be removed from the set list. Remember, this is the early 1950s, the days before airbrushing baseball cards came in and made our baseball cards really goofy looking. <laughs> Fain was a good player and a perennial all-star in the 1950s, so omitting him was somewhat of a loss for fans in 1953. Okay, now, the biggest and most legendary of the proof cards is this one, which has come to be known as Dodgers in Action, although technically there's no official titling on the card itself. It depicts a member of the Brooklyn Club sliding at home plate with a safe call from the umpire. To date, the players and umpire have not been identified. Is it Pee Wee Reese? Is it Gil Hodges? Are they playing the Cubs? The speculation continues. I'd love to know if anybody has any ideas. Feel free to share them in the comments. Although some have guessed that this was meant to be a card for a Dodger player that was then replaced with a more close-up photograph, I actually believe that Bowman was considering releasing a series of horizontal action cards. The Pee Wee Reese card would have been one of them. This card and the Reese are very similar in that they show action on the field, and of course, they're horizontal. It could very well be that there were going to be, say, a handful of horizontal cards sprinkled throughout the set, which, in my opinion, would have been freaking incredible. 
But just to be clear, this is all just my personal theory, maybe my personal wish, and it's not necessarily what Bowman planned to do. Either way, they scrapped the Dodgers in action card, and right now, it only exists as a what-if. Not surprisingly, the proofs were blank backs. And also, on the front, they don't have the thin black border that separates the photo from the white border on the finished cards. It's also notable that the proofs have a waxy coating on the front that has a negative impact on the overall color and effect of the Kodachrome photo. Lastly, you'll notice that there's a small blue line on the left-hand side of each of the proofs, which is a printer's mark for positioning and printing. So there you have it, four Bowman proofs known to exist from the early days of creating that iconic set. Now after all that, if you feel a little gypped because you thought I actually owned a proof card and were let down by this video because you thought I was going to show one and I didn't, well, I guess I apologize. But the reality is, the chances of me, or any of us for that matter, owning a 1953 Bowman Color proof card are probably pretty slim. But that doesn't mean we can't enjoy digging into the history of these beautiful cards and, in the process, increase our appreciation for just how amazing they are and how they were made. For all of their fame, the true history of how some of these cards came to be doesn't seem to be as much of a part of the conversation as it should be, but that's just my two cents. Thanks for watching everybody, and I'll see you on the next one.